second district for five minutes for questions. Th thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I believe uh, all my colleagues here in the committee agree we want the internet to remain a, a free and open place. Uh, but s since 1996, uh, it's been operated, Section 230 has been operated under a light touch regulatory framework, allowing <laughs> online companies and providers to moderate their content heavily under an immunity shield. And I think many of us have seen some problems with that regulatory framework. Uh, the American public gets very little insight into the decision-making process when content is moderated, and they have little recourse when they're censored or restricted. Uh, recently, Americans experienced a high level of online policing from big tech during the last election, uh, and uh, you know people saw a lot of things, stories being taken down immediately from Twitter and Facebook and whatnot. It's Congress's job to make sure that big tech companies are not obstructing the flow of information to benefit the political agenda, and to ensure a free and competitive news market. It's our job to promote transparency and truth. Uh, as a member of the Select Committee on China and the Speaker's AI Task Force, I have major concerns about the risks of our, uh, to our internet ecosystem from the Chinese Communist Party and other adversarial nations. Uh, our younger generation, in addition, has never been more susceptible to foreign propaganda. Dr. Uh, Dr. Stanger. Uh, you stated in your testimony that liberal democracy depends on public uh, deliberation to make citizens feel connected to a common enterprise that they feel they had a hand in shaping. But the techno-authoritarianism that we see on display in China especially sacrifices individual rights on the altar of Communist Party ideology. How can we ensure uh, potential 230 reforms will safeguard Americans from that kind of nefarious online action? I mean, would amending the law to exclude companies uh, with direct or indirect ties to CCP, is that a start? I think if you were, if you were to uh, repeal uh, Section 230C1 and hold companies liable, you could get at a lot of these problems quite directly. One point I think that's really important to read into the record that might be a surprise to some of you is that there are two versions of TikTok. There's the version for the United States and there's the version for <laughs> China. And the version for China optimizes for things like well-being, test scores, it limits the number of hours on the platform. Uh. We all know that the American version is something else entirely if you spend any time at it. It's, it, it is super addictive and it's definitely not uh, raising test scores or optimizing for well-being. I think that speaks volumes about the differences in values between China and the United States in this issue area. I loved your comment on national security as well. That was uh, that was very good. Uh, Dr. Franks, uh, I was recently at a conference with major players in the generative AI uh, uh, space we're, we're talking to us. Uh, and I, by the way, your testimony was very helpful, I thought, in explaining the 230 in the way that was working. So, uh, some of these uh, speakers are very hesitant to discuss what data their algorithms, their large language models are actually trained on. Uh, but they were very clear that they didn't want to be held liable for the output of those same algorithms. Do you think clarifying Section 230, um, so a, a generalized, so we get more to the AI outputs, would we, can we incentivize those platforms to invest in higher quality training or data? That was to Dr. Franks. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Sorry, we're, we're a little confused about that. But uh, yes, I think that one thing that should be made clear, and I, I, I do want to emphasize that I think a commonsensical reading of Section 230 would suggest that generative AI would not get protections, right? Because there's that distinction made in Section 230 between being a provider of, of these services versus being an information content provider. And an, a single entity can have both of those functions at different times. If you are uh, taking in inputs and you are giving something over, a new thing that didn't exist before, um, some speech that was not there before, an image that didn't exist before, it's quite clear that that is your own product. And therefore, the intermediary liability, uh, immunity from liability simply shouldn't apply. That being said, many of us have been pointing out that for 20 years it should have been obvious that this interpretation and that interpretation and this particular um, defense by, by a particular company shouldn't have made sense under Section 230, and yet courts did it anyway. I, I like the way you pointed it out, actually, your testimony, that, that, that we have turned this, this law on its head. 
with common law, and now we need to, I think, get back in with statutory law. And uh, so I, I thank you. I think, by the way, all three members of the panel, I think that you've really helped us with clarification 230, uh, and I do see our responsibility to follow some of these guidelines. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you. The chairman's time has expired.